So what I'd like to do today is share some images and video and some dharma that I kind of find inspiring myself. Hopefully you'll find it inspiring and engaging as well. It's the first time I've given this particular talk, so uh, apologies if it's not quite brushed up in the way like that. Fingers crossed that it will be all flow well. Um, so yeah, this weekend is celebrating the Buddha's enlightenment, which was about two and a half thousand years ago. But that's still significant for us today now, because in a way his enlightenment made it possible for other people to follow in his pathway and also gain enlightenment themselves, so we can make steps in that direction as well. I wanted to give this talk about the enlightenment, creativity, celebrating creativity and enlightenment today. One of my colleagues said, oh, we need something to do a talk about the French Festival, we haven't got anything lined up. Anybody want to do it now? Really sick. Yes, okay. <laughs> so, created some content which hopefully is going to be interesting. And for me, there's a very strong link between creativity and enlightenment and meditation. I think meditation is a great tool to opening up into our creativity and allows us to be creative in all aspects of our life in terms of how we live our life and our lifestyle, the people we live with, the people we work with as well as actually producing works of art. So I'm going to come more fully back to that later at the end of the talk. So there's some it's kind of creative goodies at the end. Um, but I'm going to begin with some basic kind of history of the Buddha and enlightenment. I'm going to show a little five minute clip uh, from a documentary called Buddha, a documentary about Buddhism. 2,500 years ago, Nestled in a fertile valley along the border between India and Nepal, a child was born who was to become the Buddha. The stories say that before his birth, his mother, the queen of a small Indian kingdom, had a dream. A beautiful white elephant offered the queen a lotus flower and then entered the side of her body. When sages were asked to interpret the dream, they predicted the queen would give birth to a son destined to become either a great ruler or a holy man. One day, they said, he would either conquer the world or become an enlightened being, the Buddha. People like stories. It is one of the ways we learn. The story of the Buddha's life is an archetypal journey, but it is a means to an end. It is not an end. Within 10 months, as a tree lowered a branch to support her, a baby boy was born, emerging from her side. Seven days later, the queen died. The world is filled with pain and sorrow the Buddha would one day teach. But I have found a serenity, he told his followers, that you can find too. Everybody understands suffering. It's something that we all share with everybody else. It's at once utterly intimate and utterly shared. So Buddha says, that's a place to begin. That's where we begin. No matter what your circumstances, you will end up 
losing everything you love, you will end up aging, you will end up ill. And the problem is that we need to figure out how to make that all be all right. What he actually said was that life is blissful. There's joy everywhere, only we're closed off to it. His teachings were actually about opening up the joyful or blissful nature of reality. But the bliss and the joy is in the transitoriness. Do you see this glass? I love this glass. It holds the water admirably. When I tap it, it has a lovely ring. When the sun shines on it, it reflects the light beautifully. But when the wind blows and the glass falls off the shelf and breaks, or if my elbow hits it and it falls to the ground, I say, of course. But when I know that the glass is already broken, every minute with it is precious. Everybody, every human being wants happiness. And Buddha, he acts like a teacher. You are your own master. Future, everything depends on your own shoulder. Buddha, Buddha's responsibility is just to show the path. That's all. The Buddha can shine out from the eyes of anybody. Inside the buffeting of, of an ordinary human life, at any moment what the Buddha found, we can find. see commonly, we, we, we've seen, probably seen hundreds of images of Buddhas ourselves through our life, just whether it's in shops or temples or Buddhist centers or in books or whatever. So we're quite used to seeing an image of the Buddha. It's very much kind of part of society. But in the old days when the Buddha was actually alive, of course, you know, people wouldn't be seeing uh, an image of the Buddha. And in early Buddhism, you wouldn't see an image of the Buddha until about, I think it was about three or four hundred years after he actually died. So, his early disciples, because um, he taught all over India, a massive area of India, he kind of walked and taught to thousands of people. And one of the things that seemed to happen was when people are away from him, from him as we do when we're away from people that we appreciate, we bring them to mind, we recollect that person. So and obviously if it's something that you have a great respect for or appreciate or you believe to be wise or loving and compassionate, then there's quite a lot of energy that would go into that. So there's a practice called the mindfulness of the Buddha or a recollection of the Buddha whereby you call to mind the Buddha, an enlightened being, partly to remind you of the possibility of enlightenment, of wisdom, of compassion, See, the full capacity of uh, a human being that you can move towards. Now, way back in those times, they never used to depict actually the Buddha himself. So there would be a seat where the Buddha would have sat. So, so in all these sort of images and things like that. So he would have sat there. Now around there's this kind of uh, image of this, a tree where he gained enlightenment under, and then there's these figures, sort of demons that were trying to kind of. Uh, distract him from gaining enlightenment or kind of taunt him or tempt him away from that. So that's one thing that happened. Another one is that there would just be an image of a foot, uh, probably partly because the Buddha did so much walking around. And then also, um, you'll see here there's a, uh, a wheel called the Dharma wheel, or Dharma chakra, which has got eight spokes on it, which represents the noble eightfold path, it's sort of eight lived path the Buddha taught, including working on uh, trying to cultivate effective or kind of right speech, perfect speech, emotion, livelihood, action, meditation, uh, concentration, um, samadhi, so that's 
full nice and sense. I think I've missed any out, I think that's all of them. Uh, so there would be those images around as well. But commonly what happened is uh, a stupa. Now a stupa, there are many different forms of, and it's said that it came out of a story whereby the Buddha was close to his death and his closest disciple, who was like his attendant, went with him up the time through his life, through his teaching. So, well, what should we do with your remains when you die? And he said, well, he took his robe and then took his, his bowl, as you probably know, he walked around and sort of begged for his food and he turned it upside down. And, you know, bury me in that, you know. So, that is a possibly, as the story goes, the legend goes, the beginning of the stupa. Now, very kind of simple form of the stupa is like this, an old sort of burial mound. So an enlightened teacher's remains would have been buried inside there, and sometimes I believe it's sitting up. And it seems that apparently when the Buddha died, bits of his remains were taken to various different places uh, throughout India, and I think even further than that. Uh, over the years, as things develop, of course you get more and more elaborate forms and as they spread around the world, they'll be embellished with various kind of uh, carvings as um, you know, the way stories began to be told and things became more and more developed. So in Sarnath, that was where the Buddha gave his first teachings in the deer park there, there's kind of quite a simple one there. Then the Mahabodhi temple, where it's said that the Buddha gained enlightenment, sort of near there, I and mean, it just backs onto uh, the Bodhi tree, where it's sat and gained enlightenment. So it's quite, in a way, you can see similarities. It's a stupa, you can see some of the aspects of the architectural form in that. But there are, you know, so in a way there's those simplicities, but it's also got other symbolic meanings in terms of different sections of it mean different things or relate to different elements, so the, what we call the six elements. So the element of earth, the element of water, the element of fire, wind, or sometimes called air, of space, and then sometimes there's often another one, uh, consciousness as well, so this one represents five, but sometimes there's six. And it relates to meditation practice where we visualize and we recollect that our bodies are made of all these elements and those elements all come and go and we come and go and we become aware that we're insubstantial in the sense there's nothing really that lasts about us and so we're insubstantial, impermanent and there's, there's an unsatisfactoryness with that if we become attached to a sense of self and we think of ourselves as always being the same all the way through our life and so we'll carry on from there. So the liberation comes from being able to kind of see that actually if we don't hold on to those things and we can hold really lightly and just let those things come and go in a sense, then we can hold more lightly to life and our energy is more available to be more creative, to be more heartful with other beings. Also when we recognise that in a way that's all of us, in a way, we're all the same, we're all made of the same elements and we all want to be happy, we all suffer. If we can engage with that reality, then there's more likelihood that we can empathise with others and connect with others and be of benefit to others. So, then, Buddhism sort of spread all over Asia. So, two and a half thousand years ago, he was very much active in India, and then of course his teachings spread. And this map just shows up until about five or six hundred years after the death of Christ. But of course, nowadays it's spread globally, like because of the nature of social media and email and web things and all the rest of it, publications like that. Any communications can spread throughout the world very easily at a click of a button as we all know. I'm going to show you some images from some of these different areas and how styles change and things. Mm. <coughs> 
So this is Borobudur, uh, which is in Indonesia, in Java, and it's a kind of stu a form of a stupa, but uh, people would, it's got the life story of the Buddha, or central life story of the Buddha, carved around it until you get up to the top. It is kind of one big stupa in a sense, but it's empty in the middle, kind of symbolized emptiness in the spaciousness of the enlightened mind. On the top, there's all these stupids again and again, and some of them have got Buddhas inside. This is a stupa in Spain. A, this tradition's got a, a retreat center in Spain where people go uh, to practice a long retreat. And people are ordained into uh, this order. So it's got a very lovely example of one there. And Thailand, so you can see elements kind of built into their kind of temple there. And you can see each country in a way has got its own embellishments, its own kind of creative sort of styles, you know, some very spirally, some quite angular, quite formed in a way, or combinations of the two, and different uh, materials are used. This is in uh, Japan, this is somewhere I went to myself about 10 years ago. There's some amazing painting inside as well, that's about 50 metres high. Central. The very famous one, Bodhanath, which is in Nepal. And famous, but I mean, possibly seen an image of these eyes. And people say wherever you go around there, those eyes are kind of haunted in the way. It's quite a spe spectacle at night, I believe. <laughs> and of course, Tibet. It's a very simple form. And in Scotland, there's a, a beautiful one, a place called Sammy Lane. And a retreat centre in Norwich. This is a retreat centre that I go to regularly. That's all uh, set up, I think, that's for an ordination as well. But we, I don't know if you've heard of Butterfield Festival. It's a uh, festival in the uh, West Country where about 3,000 people gather together and it's it's kind of a Buddhist festival with arts and healing and dance and meditation and just a really kind of lovely community event. There's a couple of guys from Brighton went last year and they created this stupa there. And it's lovely to see if that's Padmapani who made it uh, with a colleague who's there. And they were, they were commonly they're circumambulated, so they walked around and people will be reflecting on the possibility of enlightenment or on something of meaning of some qualities. So that was quite fun last year because you can't see, but there's, because it's so muddy and things, all the, the worms are coming up to the surface, so people are sort of going around trying to collect these worms so they don't stand on them. <laughs> <coughs> uh, this is one that we made here, myself and my <coughs> colleagues, somebody called Lucy and the whole team of us, we made a, a lantern version one which could be lit up at night which we used on another festival day and also for burning the clocks and you know burning mm. the clocks for the lantern break. So we carried that through Brighton and you can see there's a few verses of community here, Live United, Ferris of Truth, Radiate Love. So that's why we've sort of seen that go through town. I put a few festival, we often have these kind of big uh, performance or ritual things and one year we made all these uh, lotus flowers out of uh, wood and fabric and in here we had a fire and there's about, I, I don't know, it could have been up to 2,000 people um, in total there and they're all kind of chanting and all floating and then, um, and in a way it was almost to like invoke the qualities of enlightenment, of, of a being to arise in our minds and hearts and then it's kind of like, <laughs> I was standing there, that did feel quite dramatic. <laughs> 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 Fire like that. Um, so that was quite lovely to do. So going on to the actual images of the Buddha, um, this is one that we have here in this uh, room here. It seems that the first kind of images of the Buddha were found, or paintings of the Buddha were found in these caves, in Ajanta, the Ajanta caves. Some quite lovely, kind of lyrical, quite flowing lines in, in that image there. 
as well as some more kind of quite classic carved stone figures. But trying to create an image of uh, an enlightened being is quite something for an artist. This is a little video of uh, an artist called Andy Weber, Weber, who creates many, many figures of, of Buddhist figures, and uh, just kind of showing the kind of level of detail in a kind of traditional form. Yes. Uh, this is a close-up of a Buddha figure which is in the basement here, made by a local artist and Buddhist called Indra Bodhi. Um, it's a sort of slightly starting kind of Chinese influence in some ways. Uh, that's a image of it. It's got a lovely kind of quality to it, I think. It's hand, it's hand gesturing down to kind of touch the earth. It's said that when the Buddha gained enlightenment, he touched the earth to witness, for it to be witnessed, in a sense. And this is a painting by Arla, who painted the image behind us here of a uh, Buddha called Amitabha, um, very much connected to uh, the setting sun and to love and compassion. You know, most Buddhas, in a sense, have got a, there's a connection with different qualities, but you know, classic is wisdom and compassion, but some have other qualities that are drawn out to help us when we reflect on these figures to draw those qualities out of ourselves. Uh, and there's the artist himself. Arlok is a prolific painter. And I think probably over 40 years of painting various sort of iconography and also more freestyle work as well. We've got a book of his downstairs, which has got some amazing images. Here's one he painted at London Buddhist Centre. Another one which is finished. Which shows kind of various uh, archetypal figures on the left hand side and then you know actual historical disciples of his. And I quite like it for this whole kind of energy around him, a sense of light, kind of lightness and uh, openness. And this is a shrine room at the retreat centre in Norwich, the Avaloka one I was showing earlier. But something quite interesting happened here, in terms of, it went from that, kind of a flat painting, and then he was commissioned to kind of create a three-dimensional version of it, which gives quite a different sense, you know, when you're in a space of a physical form, uh, as opposed to a flat 2D painting, it has a different feeling about it, and there's something about uh, having a human form, a representation of a human form, that changes your relationship to it. It somehow has a kind of energy to it, which is different to a flat painting. I think paintings are, are brilliant and really important, but uh, sculptures are, are something different. Again, thick scene of the Buddha, uh, I guess, gaining enlightenment, or at the point of gaining enlightenment, as I was mentioning earlier, there was uh, it's sort of forces of temptation, so the beautiful girl down the bottom that would just try and take him away from his concentration, and then these kind of demonic sort of figures sort of trying to kind of uh, get him to be angry or to be afraid or to be doubt or trying to take away his uh, possibility of gaining enlightenment and then through that focus. There's a, another one which I think has got a really kind of beautiful kind of light quality, you really get a sense of radiance. And I think in a way this a little bit like how you feel when we meditate, can't kind of, it's just kind of inner glow <coughs> that can happen and really focused. So those forces of uh, temptation or distraction in a sense, they go on in all of us until until we gain enlightenment. In a way there's always something within us that is you know trying to couple away, oh you should really be thinking about work, oh you know, that person and I've got to do this, I've got to do that. No, I can't possibly meditate anyway. I mean, who might think I can meditate? No, no I'll, go and, I'll go and do something else, you know, or uh, you know, we get caught up in ill will towards somebody. So there's all these sort of things that we have to kind of work with. And that, to me, is the creative process, in a sense. When we can work effectively with our minds, which meditation uh, teaches us to do uh, through the practice, then we can transform all these things that happen in our mind and become more positive, kind of happy, or well-being person, orientated towards being of benefit to other people and ourselves. So there's something about kind of turning from, you know, we all in a way 
are interested in ourselves in a sense, and the more we can turn towards outwards, towards other people, then in a sense there's more possibility of happiness because you know, if we're all connecting with one another and one of us is happy, we're happy that the other person is happy, then you've got a million sources of happiness rather than just, I'm concerned with my happiness, I want to be a bit of care about all that, you know, all you people here, I just want to be happy. Whereas if I'm interested in your happiness and you're happy, then of course it's like, it's a win-win, isn't it? So there's meditation where we kind of turn those responses around, the loving-kindness practice, a five-stage practice, where we start with cultivating loving awareness to ourselves, and then we think of a good friend, turn towards them, try and wish them to be well and happy. And then we think of a neutral person, so it could be anybody else here in this room that we don't know, try and wish them to be well or happy. And then it gets really <coughs> pretty, we imagine somebody that we dislike, or we've got a disharmonious relationship with, or something like that. And we try and connect with them and recollect that you know they're a human being, they want to be well or happy as well. We try and open our hearts towards them as well. And it can be a really amazing, powerful tool. Um, I was a personal story. I remember when I first learned that meditation, I was in Glasgow with the centre, and I, I remember I was really furious with my dad. <laughs> my mum's sitting at the back here, she was <laughs> And I went to this class, and the guy sort of taught us a nice kind of body awareness, so that's what we did at the beginning, and then he led us through these stages of uh, doing this loving kindness practice. And, and I put him in the difficult person stage. And by the end of it, I came up kind of glowing with appreciation and I love for this man that I've been going on a bit cloud over my head. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I came up glowing and it's just like, wow, this clearly works. You know, it's clearly medicine for me. Mm -hmm. So I return again and again to that practice. And I think it's a really invaluable practice. But, um, yeah. There's all sorts of other practices, and I'll share one. Of course, many uh, other artists have shown images of the Buddha. This is Odilon Redon, who probably some of you have heard of. Not that. I really like this quite sketchy sort of style in a sense, and all the kind of flowers, and it's just got kind of quality of radiance to it. He painted quite a few paintings of the Buddha. Another one here, kind of walking. It's got something of that kind of inward. Contemplative, but connected to nature aspect here. <coughs> One a very different style, which I really like. I mean, if you look really in there, there's all <coughs> sorts of aspects of the Buddha's life and his other creatures. I mean, they're all beings in there. There's an old guy here. There's you know, horses, kind of roaring like people and meditating. But amazing when you really look at it. I mean, it's probably quite hard to see the subtlety of it in a projection such a beautiful thing. Uh, down to the very simple one, this is uh, this on the shrine at the moment. This is actually the first Buddha that the Bright Buddha Center <coughs> was given by somebody, I think in 1974, is that right? Yeah. Mm. Um, but I just thought it was, I mean, that smile, I mean, how could you not sort of feel happy looking at that smile? You know, it's just lovely, gorgeous, brilliant thing. And then others that are just infinitely complex. And this is, I'm not sure if it's the Chinese or Japanese version of a figure called Avalokiteshvara. In Chinese, <coughs> Japanese it would be called Kanon. And sometimes uh, the name I think means something like the Lord with a thousand arms. Which as you can see, he's got quite a few at least. <laughs> and in each of the hands it will be holding a different thing. And each of those things are a symbol towards um, benefiting other beings and in some versions they've also I think there were also um, eyes on the hands as well to help see the suffering and the hand then can act towards helping other beings of suffering <coughs> and there's also uh, I think there's 10 or 11 heads and looking in all the directions of the universe so north, south, east, west, up and down etc etc Amazing. Sometimes you see forearm versions of that. I wanted to share this one, which is of a uh, an earth, the earth goddess said that was supposedly present when the Buddha was trying to gain enlightenment and bear and bore witness. I don't know if you remember that image where he was touching his hand to the ground. Uh, apparently, the earth goddess came and acknowledged that yes, he had gained enlightenment. He had done it. 
So that'd be a nice figure to be greeted by, wouldn't it? <laughs> So this is a painting I did myself, um, White Taran. So she's a figure that's often seen with sort of uh, five eyes, so one in each hand, the usual two in the face and one in the forehead, the third eye. So again, uh, an embodiment of uh, passion. Here's one you may be familiar with, one that Banksy did. You don't know that. Did you say that Banksy painted the Buddha? <laughs> And a local one that a couple of graffiti artists have done, um, actually it's just been painted over, funny enough, it's on the top of Villa and Hut, um, a kind of furniture shop around the corner. But there's a nice little video of them kind of doing it, it was, uh, it was a bit too, uh, I couldn't show because it was very pixelated. But, you know. This is a huge one, uh, this is in Japan, one of those, <coughs> uh, Nara, a bronze. Uh, which is in this temple, which as you can see, you can see the scale of those things. I think it was maybe something like the eighth century. And they had to get all these, all the wood for this had to be travelled down a uh, river, uh, I can't remember how many miles, but a long way. And I think all the, the bronze for the wood of it as well, also. I mean, you know, they didn't have tracks, they didn't have trains, all that sort of thing. So the amount of effort. And uh, this building burnt down. This is a recreation of another one. So it's just an effort for people to put in. So this, now I showed this one because you can see there's a few other figures around this central <coughs> figure. And this is something that happened in various traditions within Buddhism, where there will be uh, a mandala, so a kind of a circle, which I'll show some new talk in a moment, like here, and there'll be one central figure, and then there'll be other Buddha figures around, and they've all got different qualities, and this would be something that would be born in mind and meditation. So, so we've actually got an image of each of these painted in here for kind of celebrations this weekend. So, one in the centre is uh, Virochina, kind of brilliant white light, Purification in a sense, and here we've got a mobile city which is to do with kind of fearlessness. So, uh, you would imagine this figure, if you know, you're going through fearful things, perhaps you could call this being to mind, help you kind of go through uh, fear. And then you've got Exhobia, and they're all associated with different directions as well. Uh, Amitabha, Good of Love. And then Ratnasambo is associated with the direction of the south, I and mean, when you can in the southeast, this is the Buddha of, <laughs> Buddha of Brighton. <laughs> uh, and a painting, you know, we've probably all seen images of various mandalas, and there's so many different ones. I mean, this is a really complicated one with lots of different symbols and things. And of course, sometimes these are made of sand as well. And three dimensional versions of as well. So circles, uh, you'll see circles in a lot of images in relation to enlightenment. So the Zen circle, the Enzo, representing that kind of the perfect circle, but it's, all, it's done in just one brush stroke and the kind of level of concentration and mindfulness done. Uh, sometimes you see people, I was trying to find an image of this uh, in Ditchling a few years ago. There was a Japanese calligrapher that came on and he had a, a huge, big, like, human sized brush. And he kind of walked around and did one massive big kind of brush, which is lovely to kind of see. It's a real community there. And in fact, you know, this is on P Interest. There's somebody who kind of created this lovely photoshopped image. It's quite fluid and lyrical. Right through to this is a tattoo somebody has kind of created, which uh, I think it's really lovely. That connects somehow to sort of nature as well, so, as well as the obvious Zen gardens. This is a, a, an early, a, an image I saw of David Hockney's uh, when I was a teenager and it really struck me as something about his photo collages and something about the actual experience of him kind of walking around the Zen garden. I mean, you, nowadays you can't actually walk on the garden but you can walk all around it. So he's taking his shoes off and he takes shoes off to go in the temple and he's kind of taking photos of him going all with that. And just all the different sections of it to make up that one sense. And it's, um, 
when I went to this place, it was in May, around this kind of time, about 10 years ago, it's got a really peaceful energy, it's a really kind of beautiful stillness to it. So people can go there and just sit and meditate. But also, as well as stillness, people can express their kind of connection uh, to with movement as well. So commonly around this time, the, the Waisak, there will be um, parades of uh, people with kind of lanterns, candles, uh, making offerings. I like this sort of uh, exposure, so, you know, long exposure of people walking along with candles. But also incredible parades. I mean, that's some huge Ross kind of light sculpture. I think it's in Thailand, um, which went along and parade various kind of paintings or different aspects of Buddhist lifestyle as well. Um, I don't know, I'm just quite, they're sort of quite wacky and fantastical out there. And quite kind of day glow as well. <laughs> like it. And at the Brighton Buddhist Centre here, we got involved in Brighton Carnival uh, a few years ago. We sort of uh, borrowed this big panel thing from the same sky and uh, we wandered around. So that's Indra Bodhi, he created that sculpture in the background of Buddha. And we had about 60 of us all in pro with different figures from uh, the Wheel of Life, uh, which is a nice symbol which I won't go into the most of the all day. So this is the, the gods and goddesses, an uh, uh, aspect of the Wheel of Life, actually I should describe it. Basically six sections of the Wheel of Life. Uh, one of them is the gods and goddesses, so in a sense they're you know, very kind of happy themselves. And then this, um, we've got Maha Sukha here, who's a sort of singing teacher who leads workshops on soulful singing and mantras and things here. He may have come to some of the festivals. So that was quite lovely. We were all dancing and singing at the same time, quite fluid with those things. And that's close up. And you may or may not recognise somebody in this room. Yeah, that's that. <laughs> and we also have big puppets of the uh, Yamaraja, the Lord of Death. So it's, as we know, in a way, throughout our life, we've always got this figure behind us in the Grim Reaper, in a sense. This is the Buddhist version of Grim Reaper, in a sense, you could say, or the Lord of Death. So we made one of these to break around through Brighton, as well as a whole load of skeletons. So which we call the Darklings, the dancing skeletons. So uh, that, that was great fun. Um, and that was kind of inspired by. Uh, in Tibet, they have these amazing sort of ritual dance performance, dancing skeletons in rituals. So, but also, somebody else you may or may not recognise in this room. <laughs> and uh, uh, Tess, sitting over there, and myself, we made this costume, sort of gold, green, carnival queen. Uh, uh, I think for me, it had something of an expansiveness, that like kind of gold and heart, open heartedness. That's us rehearsing the skeletons in this room. <laughs> and that's us going crazy in the seat. <laughs> <laughs> and we did have a lot, we did things, uh, actually, yeah, we came near a year ago, weren't you? We would, we would take turns um, kind of lying down on the floor, and somebody would chalk around. <laughs> you know, and uh, of course, the audience didn't know this was going to happen, so a few people got caught up. You, you, you thought, because I'd had the flu just yes. before. So, <laughs> Mary sort of saw me, Are you alright? You're okay. You're okay. <laughs> Afterwards, I got up. So it was quite funny. So. Um, and this is uh, another figure so for a white night, right? And, uh, and events which happened a few years ago. So it was kind of the. Uh, a man of living, Elan, a character on the right. Uh, this is a puppet that's in the inside. <laughs> and then, um, I can't remember her actual name, sort of Mexican figure, so in a way, kind of death, in a way. And it was kind of like a marriage of life and death, sort of rep representing that kind of duality, in a way. Both are always present, so a big moment. Um, and this is uh, a wise horse, a wise horse. Uh, based on a Buddhist figure called Wind Horse, uh, which was said to kind of carry the three precious jewels of the world throughout the universe. So uh, the possibility of enlightenment, the idea of enlightenment that we can all move towards, the dharmas, the teachings that help us take us there, 
and then the Sangha, so the community of people both who have gained enlightenment and also those people that are on their way towards enlightenment. So that was fun, that was a bit of a food festival. There's two of us, and you can probably just about see our bodies and nerves running around with that. Probably not going on. <laughs> a bit of a windy day. seafront with my baby in front of me in the sling and just kind of preparing for this talk and one of the things I was thinking about was nature and the beauty of nature and how nature can open our hearts to creativity and just connecting uh, generally with, with life as a whole and one of the things I was thinking about was this figure which I'll show you in a minute which is is always kind of rainbow coloured and uh, I kind of looked up and it's this glorious rainbow <laughs> and my phone battery had died and I, and this guy was sort of walking around and you know, this is 7 o'clock in the morning he said, would you please take a shot of that? So he just sort of put them together for me and sent it to me and it was quite <laughs> sweet. <laughs> now, rainbows just hold so much for us, don't they? It's very hard to see here, but it's kind of some kind of miracle in a sense where there's kind of shadow of the Buddha surrounded by a rainbow, which I think appeared in some Chinese province. What you make of these sort of things. I don't know if that is. Uh, I love this image for that kind of quality of open, openness, just that kind of glowing radiance. Uh, which I'm going to return to in a moment. I wanted to share this character. So it's uh, a Tibetan, well, actually, a man that lived in what was Pakistan, uh, I think it's quite the 8th century. And he took Buddhism from India to Tibet. Uh, kind of real, it was kind of for me, it was a real sense of kind of uh, a kingly kind of quality, but he's also a bit of a magician, you know, his life story is kind of full of all these transformations of uh, where he's working with kind of inner and external demons in a sense. But I just love that part. And also, you can often see a kind of wrathful smile because he's not afraid of turning towards reality as it actually is. He faced reality as it is, you know, and sometimes we need a kind of wrathful energy in our lives, don't we, to kind of turn towards what's real and deal with things necessary. Um, and Buddhism is full of all these kind of rich symbols, and symbols are kind of messengers of beauty and truth for me, I think, you know, it's kind of holding this skull cup full of amrit nectar, kind of uh, is sometimes seen as blood and sometimes as energy for enlightenment, for the benefit of all beings. So they drink from that. It's kind of showing he's liberated from mundane activities. And the gorgeous rainbow version of the rainbow aura. And then one of I'd like to just take us through a little a short meditation if you're open to that. So set yourself up into a comfortable position. It won't be long, just somewhere between five and ten minutes. So this poem uh, is by Sangha, <coughs> who founded this Buddhist tradition. It's called simply meditation. Here, perpetual incense burns. The heart to meditation turns. And all delights and passions spurns. A thousand brilliant hues arise, more lovely than the evening skies. And pictures paint before our eyes. All the spirit's storm and stress is stilled into a nothingness, and healing powers descend and bless. Refreshed, we rise and turn again to mingle with this world of pain, as on roses falls the rain. Thank 
comfortable as you can, just letting the weight sink down. Rising easily up out of your cushion or a chair. And allow your mind to expand and visualize a vast, clear blue sky. of clouds, just brilliant, bright, blue sky. Seemingly luminous, radiant with life and energy. This kind of golden glowing light. Brilliantly radiating. And as you look closer, you can see a beautiful smile radiating this golden glowing light. See if you can see more of the face. joy, peace, happiness. Imagine as though there was a kind of radiant aura around this figure. Sensing what that feels like. The body, the mind. And the feeling level, emotionally, how does that feel? Very slowly come out of the fence, take your time, just gradually broadening your awareness. 
once again to include the space that we're in. invite you to just share a little bit of essence of what that was like, just that simple little meditation there, what that was like with somebody next to you. So maybe what it felt like, or what your mind was like, or a little bit about maybe your experience and image, what that was, so that meant for you. You don't have to, it's a meditation, and you'd rather not, that's fine. But sometimes some lovely things can come out of these sorts of communications. So just a couple of minutes each way. So um, if you turn to a person next to you, perhaps one minute or somebody you don't know, may know, just share a few things about what you just in a short period of time. So, you know, quite amazing things. Now, what I'd like to do is a little uh, creative activity visualization to help you connect with your own creativity and how to bring that out into your life. I'm sure you're all creative anyway, but sometimes it's good to just top up the, uh, the batteries, isn't it? So, I'm going to refresh do. Right, first thing, choose a creative activity. Uh, could be one that you already do and enjoy doing now and again or regularly or once in a blue moon or whatever. But just have something in mind that you do where it might be something that you've always dreamed about doing and I'd love to do it but I never quite make time because I've got to do this and all these things are way more important than my expectations to do that's not important. Whatever it is, choose some creative activity. Okay? Now, you may want to close your eyes for this. I'm just going to use the little fire stage thing. <coughs> or you can keep, it open, keep them open if you'd like to. So, imagine yourself doing this creative activity. Whatever your chosen one is. See if you can visualize yourself doing whatever it is. Whether it's dancing, singing, painting, writing, whatever your choice is. See it as clearly as you can, as though you were right in front of yourself doing it. Notice if any feelings come up around it, whether it's positive or negative or anything that gets in the way, whether you're quite able to visualize. Just see what happens. Imagine what it may feel like doing that process, that activity. Imagine yourself enjoying the process. Perhaps imagine the space that you would need to do this activity in, the materials you would need, the kind of conditions for you to manifest this 
rated activity. So visualize the process from beginning, the initial idea and inspiration, through to you actually creating if there's something that you make in this process, imagine a kind of final finished thing. Imagine some sort of temporary satisfaction or pleasure in doing that. Hold that in your mind, any significant thoughts, feelings, images. yourself sharing that with an audience, with whatever, if you've, in your mind, if you've made something, imagine yourself sharing that with an audience. Could be one person, could be two, could be hundreds, could be thousands, whatever seemed appropriate to you. Something of sharing your creativity with others. Just check in with yourself, is that something you would actually like to do in your life? Can you imagine yourself going home today or sometime soon? Can you imagine a time soon when you can do that activity? Be as specific as you can. Make it a, an achievable thing, target. And then just notice what that process was like for you. What, what did it feel like to do that? Did you feel able to do it? Did you believe in yourself and know, well, I could do that, yes? Or, or were there doubts or fears or anything else that arose in the process, just notice how that was for you. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand around some paper and some pens and just make a note or draw something if you want, whatever kind of visual reference you want to make of that process for you which could serve as a reminder for you, anything that was insightful there that you would, that might help you act on the process. Could be what it felt like, could be you doing the process, could be whatever it is you wanted to make or the activity you wanted to do. And so you can choose whatever's useful for you. So just take a couple of minutes to do this. And if you just want to stay with your mind instead, feel free to do that. But uh, there's an invitation to make it a benefit to you. You can take one and pass it along, and that's the easiest thing. Maybe, um, maybe I'll take some pounds back and uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so you can take a pen or whatever and pass it on. So just about another five, ten minutes for.
being accountable for you, that you might forget unless you make a note of something you can stick on your fridge to remind yourself to do something or somewhere you'd see and go, oh yes, yeah, I must do that. Right, I'm going to do that. Actually. Just a little gentle nudge in the direction of your creativity. helpful to visualize yourself doing what it is you love doing and you want to do. Actually do it. You know, a good little nudge now and again to do. I use it a lot and, and whenever I'm about to do a project, whatever, I sometimes can imagine myself doing this thing, beginning, middle and end, and bring it to mind. You know, what are the stages of things I need to do? What might come up in the way that might prevent me doing? What doubts? What fears? What beliefs of myself that well, I can't do this or I can't do that or what do I need to kind of clear the decks to create the conditions to enable myself to do this. I just think there's a few other th things that I think can be helpful. Uh, I mean explore the links between meditation and your creativity. Uh, try to encourage you to kind of do both. You know, if you can create a regular meditation practice and a regular creative uh, process practice, the two can intermingle and really influence one another. And I definitely say the best artworks I've done have come from a space of meditative absorption, or at least from an inspiration. Or in the quality of focus you get, I think, when you're creating, in the process of creating, can be very similar to meditation. Uh, sometimes, uh, so much used to say that it's meditation is a direct way of creating a higher state of consciousness, and raising a level of awareness. Whereas <coughs> art processes, art um, practices are an indirect method to raising a level of awareness or consciousness. So it's really important to be able to do both. You know, if 
sometimes we can be, you know, creative people in the sense we can be very creative just when we're doing our, our creative process, you know, we might be brilliant painters and all the rest of it, but, you know, the rest of our life's a mess, you know, or whatever. You know, I know people when, you know, I've been there myself, you know, but it's that turning of meditation and creativity towards the rest of our lives so we can lead an overall kind of creative life and a relationship between those two. I think it's a really fruitful uh, space to explore. So I would encourage you to do that. Also, finding other people, you know, making friendship. I'm staying in the office, but making friendships with people who also practice meditation, who also uh, do artwork that, you know, the type of artwork you do or something similar. So you've got people to explore uh, possibilities with, to sound out, out ideas, or somebody to kind of bounce back, you know, your blind spot. You know, you, you, sometimes it's hard for us to see that. You know, we think, oh, we have all these ideas, but we don't do them for whatever reason, you know. And sometimes the French is going, do you realise, actually, you know, it's completely capable of doing that. Well, you know, just, just go and do it. Somebody just to give that gentle little elbow, go on, go and do it. So, you know, creating, in a way, a community of friendships of people that value the creative process, I think, can be really helpful. I've worked with Same Sky, a um, community art, celebrating art company in Brighton for about 10 years. 13 years <laughs> doing various places, and those friendships have been really helpful uh, in terms of just kind of now getting a lot of knowledge. Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. and it's just been really good, been really useful. And then sometimes I think also have the intention behind our action can make a really significant difference to what we create and how we create it. Um, so sometimes the creative process can be just for ourselves, and that's fantastic. Sometimes that's our peaceful space, you know, or whatever it is, or you know, like that's where we're alone, the kids are to bed, or we're not at work, it's like, ah, oh, my time, me time. And that's really vital. But I think also, and the same for meditation, obviously, but also something around the turning of our attention outwards as well into that artwork being a benefit both to yourself and to other people. And again, it's that kind of broadening out of our sphere of influence and awareness into more beings. And you know, if you imagine if we're all doing that throughout the world, you know, it's a very significant effect. And I guess there being conditions where that sort of thing can happen you know, on arts retreats and things like that. And the kind of level of connection and communication things that happens between people is really beautiful. It's like uh, you're being in a, um, I sort of think about it, if you're all in a, what's it called, a choir or a choir or, you know, some collective activity where you're all doing something together and where you're all singing the same song sheet or something, that sense of collective practice can be really moving. <laughs> so, that's that part. And then I just kind of want to direct you, you towards a few sort of useful websites. So we just created a new website here at the Buddhist Centre, so other events like this will be advertised on there, and meditation courses, etc. Also, you can do all the usual social media things. They're uh, accessible on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, and depending how I feel about this talk, it might be on YouTube, we'll see, <laughs> on the website. Um, there's also a, a fairly new website called thebuddhistcenter.com, which acts as a kind of portal for all the Buddhist centers around the globe connected to this tradition. So there's some great things on there. There's some galleries of photos, there's uh, social networking possibilities, there's talks, there's meditations, um, there's audio on there. There's a lot, and you can connect to other people locally as well on there. And it's a brilliant resource called Free Buddhist Audio, where again you can see that there's meditation talks, guided introductions, and so, I mean, there's literally thousands of talks on there, including recordings of retreats and some really inspiring speakers on there. So that's worth, worth a look, freebuddhistaudio.com. If you want to go on a retreat, go to goingonretreat.com, simple, easy, and you know, you can choose when where and what type of retreat and there's all sorts of things from yoga, meditation, 
to art or retreats, to meditation in Buddhism, dance, solitaries, or with other people, and, you know, in various places. <coughs> There's also clearvision.org, which is basically a resource, mostly kind of video, but also images. So some of the images I showed today um, by Arlo Ka, I think remember, I think I painted this Buddha here and Chintami, and various other really talented artists are on there. But also, again, video of talks and uh, resources. And video sangha, which is more kind of talks from the Buddhist kind of community, but again, there's also artworks on there, and music, piano improvisations, and things as well. And Buddhafield, Buddhafield Festival I mentioned earlier, that's, that's a great festival to go to. Uh, 17th to 21st of July this year, about 3,300 people there. It's a really lovely, well, even if the weather's rubbish. <laughs> it's that, yeah, and you've got 3,000 people all practicing meditation together and doing all these crazy things together. It's a really lovely energy, and unless you don't like camping. <laughs> um, this is Creative Futures, uh, this is a charity set up to empower marginalised artists and writers, and they do various kind of courses in writing and artwork and various things like that, and doing some web design courses for them, but there's all sorts of things in there, I've got a few of those if you're interested, they're really good. And connected to here is uh, Evolution Arts and Health Centre, they're based just off Western Road in Brighton and they do myriads of different courses from poetry, dance, painting, um, yoga, meditation, etc, 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 etc. There's a lot there, so that's a really good resource for free. Um, that's my website, inspiringarts.co.uk, so there's various images you've seen today and various activities and things. Um, also teach yoga, so I've got you on the channel, but I'm on here, that's an inspiring yoga meditation. And um, I just want to kind of, you know, somebody, this is somebody that died recently, a um, local artist, not well enough, um, an incredibly talented person, and his work was seen by millions of people. Uh, he used to do some work for the same sky, including this kind of phoenix, uh, which was metal, you know, sculpted in metal and then fire rope attached to it which was burnt on the burning clocks a few years ago. He's inspired thousands of people. Uh, his website's worth checking out and I think for me there's something about this image and the kind of phoenix, you know, let ourselves kind of rise from our creative ashes in a sense, you know, continually recreate yourself, continually be creative, you know, just a little to do that. And lastly, um, it's an image of Sangharachtu, who founded this Buddhist tradition. Uh, he's given many, many lectures, like literally thousands of lectures, books, magazines, DVDs, and inspired millions of people to practice the word meditation and ethical living to benefit other people. So I'm just personally very grateful to him. Uh, so, I am going to stop there. If you, anybody wants to ask any queries or questions or comments or whatever, feel free. If you want to just disappear downstairs and have a cup of tea, you're very welcome. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening. I hope that hasn't been too much traveling.